Hello, this is Daryl Castle with today's Castle Report. This is Friday, the 24th day of February in the year of our Lord, 2023. I will be talking about the withdrawal of Russia from the new strategic arms reduction treaty known as New START, or START II, I guess, as well as Mr. Putin's annual speech to the Russian parliament, President Biden's trip to Poland and to Ukraine, finally China's Global Security Initiative, or GSI, concept paper. President Biden reportedly left Washington in secret at 4.15 a.m. on Sunday morning flying to Poland, where he made a speech. Then he took a 10-hour train ride to Kiev, Ukraine. The secrecy of the trip and the itinerary was certainly understandable given the security issues with the U.S. president today. I'm pretty sure the Secret Service had quite a difficult time in advance work for this trip. He chose to deliver a speech in Poland where he expressed pride in the accomplishment of building a coalition from the Atlantic to the Pacific to oppose Russia. He missed a few words a little bit, but he was trying to say that NATO, the U.S., and Japan were all in on their determination to stop Putin's brutal war of aggression. He almost always uses that rhetoric, even though reportedly in a phone conversation with Putin in January, as well as Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, in a meeting with Secretary of State Blinken, the Russians appealed to the U.S. to stop the inflammatory rhetoric to give diplomacy a chance to work. One might conclude from the continuation of that language that American diplomats do not want a negotiated peace. They don't want diplomacy to work at this time, but nevertheless, the president went on to Kiev as scheduled. He met Ukrainian President Zelensky. They walked together bravely through the streets while air raid sirens screamed for the American media. The problem with the air raid sirens was that it seems as if they were staged for TV, because National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told reporters that Russia had been informed of the president's intent and his itinerary before the visit. CNN's Alex Marquardt reported that he had been in Kiev for five days. He heard no explosions and no sirens. They started right when Biden started his stroll with Zelensky, but the two brave presidents did not scramble to the shelters, did not even get off the street. Warning the Russians in advance was understandable so that no attack would be forthcoming during the visit, but it has become kind of a tradition with our military to warn our enemies in advance. General Milley said he assured the Chinese he would warn them in advance of an American attack because his commander-in-chief, Donald Trump at the time, was supposedly crazy. When told that Chinese balloons were floating over America during the Trump administration as well, Trump said, well, that's the first I've heard of it. And the Joint Chief said, yes, that's right. We decided not to tell him because he was just too aggressive. So the Biden team notified the Russians he was going there, even though they understandably kept it secret from others. I don't mean to make light of any of this since this war is deadly serious. Raging on without end. When asked how long, how long will it go on, the president responds, quote, as long as it takes. Congress should perhaps exercise its responsibility and duty to inquire exactly as long as it takes. How long is that? Is the American taxpayer suffering from inflation at home supposed to fund this war to bleed Russia dry forever? By the way, comparably speaking, Europe pays very little in the struggle, which I suppose is another Tradition now, but it seems that escalation, the possibility of nuclear conflict, continued to grow day by day. So the president went to Kiev approximately one year after the Russian invasion. He gave the people a speech, quote, one year later, Kiev stands and Ukraine stands, democracy stands, end quote. Putin miscalculates, he told us, quote, Russia's aim was to wipe Ukraine off the map and Putin's war Of conquest is failing. Russia's military has lost half the territory it once occupied, end quote. However, he said nothing to the Ukrainian and Russian people about the Keystone pipelines, as far as I know. The war rages on. The deaths of soldiers and civilians on both sides rages on. The war is causing a drain on American taxpayers and American munition munition stockpiles as well, so I find showing up to celebrate all that a little strange especially with so many many suffering in America. Not visiting Ohio before his trip abroad was a bad look. Members of Congress on both sides of the aisle noticed that. 
many politicians and celebrities entering Ukraine these days apparently see their visit as a kind of political tourism, but one expects more. From the president, the entire photo op thing seems a little inappropriate to me. The trifecta, the trifecta that we talked about in the opening paragraph continued on Tuesday the 21st as Vladimir Putin delivered his annual speech to the Russian parliament, which is the equivalent of the State of the Union speech here in America. He emphasized the importance of Ukraine to Russia. Quote, I would like to emphasize once again that Ukraine is not just a neighboring country for us. It is an integral part of our own history, culture, and spiritual space. It is our friends, our relatives, not only colleagues, friends, and former work colleagues, but also our relatives and close family members, end quote. Here are some of the other significant words from Mr. Putin's speech in which he reminds the Russian people about what he believes America has become. Quote, and here... They constantly lie. They pervert historical facts and attack our culture con constantly. The Russian Orthodox Church and other religious organizations in our country see what they do with their own peoples. The destruction of the family, cultural and national identity, perversion, mockery of children and pedophilia are the norm. The norm of their life. Priests are forced to bless same-sex marriages. God be with them. Let them do what they want, end quote. Well, folks, sometimes it's harder when they're right. He continued to address the Russian people and to tell them why he took the actions he took in Ukraine. To do that, he decided to go into the history of the place. He explains that modern Ukraine was created entirely by Russia, more precisely by Bolshevik communist Russia. That was all just background to get the people listening, to understand the important part of the speech. In 2010, Washington and Moscow signed what became known as the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, which was intended to limit and reduce nuclear arms on either side, setting a limit of no more than 1,550 deployed warheads on 700 missiles. In March 2021, the two sides renewed that treaty for five years. It was not supposed to expire until February of 2026, if not Continued before then, non-continuation of the treaty may have been a foregone conclusion given how U.S.-Russia relations have deteriorated since the Ukraine war. The original START treaty began back in 1991. The new treaty was signed 2010 under Obama and President Medvedev as his successor treaty. Putin prepped the people for the news that he had suspended Russian participation in START II the last remaining nuclear arms control treaty with the United States. He would keep Russian strategic forces on alert as well as modernizing nuclear forces. Decades of work, folks, decades to reduce tension and danger all down the drain. I could take all this way back to John Kennedy and explain the decades of hard work to reduce tension and danger. If I had the time, the U.S. had already pulled out of many other treaties, including the Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile Treaty, which limited what missiles could be placed within short range of Russia. The accusations had been flying back and forth on the new treaty with Washington accusing Moscow of violating the treaty by refusing to allow inspections on Russian territory. Putin warned the West that if it provides Ukraine with long-range weapon system, Russia will be forced to push back the threat even further from its borders, the suspension of the treaty indicates to me that Putin recognizes the West's total effort in Ukraine. He's going to continue developing and modernizing his greatest deterrent. In other words, it means another nuclear arms race when the U.S. is some $32 trillion in debt and the defense budget is almost $1 trillion. On the other side of the world, the Chinese had to get their two cents worth in during this February of war and threats of war, the Chinese issued a Global Security Initiative, or GSI, which called on the world's nations to resolve disputes through dialogue and to reject power politics. The Chinese foreign minister spoke in Beijing on the same day as Putin's speech. He told the forum that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. He said GSI fully elaborated these ideas and principles, which support the idea that Yesterday, the Chinese called for a negotiated settlement, and they ceased fire in support of that paper. China has responsibilities as well as a firm determination to safeguard world peace and the paper list 20 cooperation directions. Without taking the time to list all 20, 
I will at least give you some of them. China supports a UN-centered security governance st structure and supports UN efforts to prevent war and to lead in post-war reconstruction. He called for a stop of hegemony and bullying and to build a peaceful coexistence with stable, balanced relations between countries. China's top diplomat, Wang Yi, recently visited Moscow. And the Wall Street Journal is reporting that Chinese leader Xi Jinping is preparing to visit Moscow for a summit with Putin in the coming months. China and Russia undoubtedly want to discuss Russia's role in what Putin portrays as his country waging war against a U.S. global order. China indicates that the GSI, in the GSI, that it wants in on this plan. It wants to play a more active role in ending the conflict, I suppose, Mr. Jinping has concluded that the war with all its accompanying sanctions is no longer good for business. Over the last few weeks, the U.S. has repeatedly warned China against providing Russia with any lethal weapons or military assistance of any kind. Xi is going to Moscow anyway, I presume, to solidify his partnership with Putin, which is what all this diplomatic shuttling and posturing between the three countries is all about. The GSI says... The China-Russia partnership is positive for the world, but according to the GSI's polls, more than 72% of respondents see the U.S. as the biggest obstacle to a Ukraine peace process. In conclusion, this is about who runs the world, who matters in this world. As someone once said, Russia is just a gas station with nuclear weapons. But Europe certainly found out most recently that the gas station is pretty important to U.S. and its NATO partners collectively referred to as the West, seem to want a unipolar world with the U.S. running it. They're willing to go to extraordinary measures to achieve that. China, with its economy serving as the manufacturing centering center of the world, is a player. It demands to be considered as a player. In short, China and Russia, with India as a possible third player, will try to rise up to Western levels or else bring the West down to their levels unless the U.S. is willing to consider them and to negotiate with them. Finally, folks, why can't we all just get along? Egos and dreams of world domination have existed and been fought over since the dawn of man's time on this earth. The problem now is that is nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons. They do not make us safer, folks. Instead, they make us less safe. At least that's the way I see it. Till next time, folks, this is Daryl Castle. Thanks for listening.